there is a place in northern France, long forgotten. Deep beneath a farmer's field, a mysterious cavern, walls covered with carvings of men facing death. And the inscriptions are just everywhere, everywhere you look. A testament to those who sought refuge here. That's incredible, isn't it? I've never seen anything like this. A Canadian soldier who marked his last day of life. Wow, this, this is so, so powerful just to see this. A British craftsman whose talent served royalty. What a work of art. A hidden place that returns a father to his son. To me, this is greater than going to the moon. Only by uncovering the stories of the men who made them can this long lost place be brought to life. Shane Schreiber of the Canadian Army is in northern France, looking for a hole in the ground. A vast underground cavern has recently been discovered just a kilometer from the site of the First World War battle of Vimy Ridge. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think you'll find it fascinating. When you Shane, an historian as well as a serving soldier, believes it holds something special. Well, I, I really want to get down there and see them. This is, uh, this is fascinating, so... Well, get your helmet. All right. The battle for Vimy Ridge was an important Allied victory of the First World War. Against formidable German defenses, over 40,000 Canadian and British soldiers fought for the heights, suffering over 10,000 casualties. More than 3,600 were killed. These steps were carved out of solid chalk 500 years ago. 40 feet beneath the earth, French farmers created a secret place of refuge called a souterrain to hide their families in times of war. In the Great War, it served the same purpose again, this time providing Allied soldiers with shelter from German bombs. This is amazing. After the war, it was used as a garbage dump by the local farmers. I guess the garbage kind of helped uh, keep the secret for all those years. Oh, look at that. Shane is not the first soldier to enter it. And the, the, the inscriptions are just, are just like everywhere, everywhere you look. There's names and dates. Caverns seem to go back forever that way. Oh, here's another one. Look at all these. It's like a nominal roll of all the soldiers that have ever had to live down here. Between four and 500 Canadian and British boys spent their last days here before the battle for Vimy Ridge in April, 1917. Left alone with their thoughts, the men passed their waking hours eating, playing cards, cleaning equipment, and carving into the soft chalk. Soldiers uh, generally tend to be a, a relatively modest bunch, um, but but maybe there's something deeper in our psyche that you know wants to make sure that we're not just not forgotten about. Oh, what a work of art! Private A. J. Ambler, and then it's got the date March 10th, 1917, so a couple of weeks before Vimy, and then he's got the um, battle honors for the, um, for the Black Watcher. When you're faced with your own mortality and the fact that you could light, your life could end at really, you know, just about any minute, I think that that's why you reach out and try and do stuff like this to, to capture, you know, to try and capture a little bit of immortality you can. Shane wants to know what happened to the men who left their marks here after they left the Sioux terrain for the last time. GM Phelps, 1st Canadian Battalion. Who lived and who died. But it's the soldier in Shane, more than the historian, who needs to know their fates. 
When I was in Afghanistan in 2002, my son was uh, two years old. Uh, I was going to go out on patrol one day, and I thought, you know, I should really write something to him because, um, you know, if the worst should happen, he, he might never have the chance to know me as a, you know, as a grown-up. So I just sat down and, and wrote him a quick letter. And then uh, I tucked it away and, you know, said, God forbid it ever has to be used. And uh, so I, I still have the letter, but I'll never show it to him. Now Shane wants to do for the men of the Souterrain what he hopes someone would do for him. Okay, would you like to do me about four lines of text and your signature, please? Okay. Yep. Elaine Quigley is a forensic graphologist. She is an expert in the psychology of handwriting. Shane wants to find out what she can tell him about the soldiers in the Sioux terrain. But first, he puts her to a test. The, uh, the results will be secret? You won't ever tell anybody what you discover about me? Uh, I try to be very honest, but tactful. <laughs> okay. I find this writing shows a lot of energy. It's got a very strong vertical emphasis, which is a person who's very purposeful. And with the high upper zone, it means that you're a focused person. You like goals to aim at. The fact that you've got quite a strong movement in some of the letters to the right, even more so than the rest of the letters, shows that there is a bit of a short fuse here. You can be made irritated by people who don't get their act together. Little hooks on some of the letters show you can be very tenacious, and also that you like to keep your thoughts to yourself. If you tell people too much, then they can interfere. So you only tell them what they need to know, and the rest of it is your business. Um, now, if we look at the signature, the signature is your face to the world, and it does match the text, particularly the first name. But when you've got your professional hat on, nobody can get close to you at all. You've got a, a very um, complex lot of strokes there, which are sort of almost like a smoke screen, and then you've got this very long end of the rapier. No one's going to get from within a mile of you. Now, the other thing, and this is not necessarily something that, that's terribly flattering, though I don't think there's anything wrong with it, is that at times you actually close down your imagination. You think, I haven't got time for that now. I haven't got time to, to take sort of leisure to think about certain things. So I must get on with what I've got to do, fulfill a requirement. Somebody says this is important. And so you haven't really got time for you, your emotional side. And my wife would agree with that too. Okay. And she probably knows me better than I know myself. Shane asks Elaine if she'd like to come to the cavern, but there's a catch. To get to this cave, you have to go down a bit of a, you know, essentially a crawl space. It's at about 45 degree angle. Uh, and then it, it'll open up, but the initial part can be a little intimidating and you're, you're not afraid of the dark, are you? Yes, not afraid of the dark, but I'm afraid of um, cl close, close. Uh, a little claustrophobic? Yes, yes. All right. Can I feel the walls very close beside me as I go down? Is it very uh, tight? The first part is, is tight. It's going to take a bit of teeth gritting to get through the... Uh, Elaine's sure claustrophobia fine. may prevent her from going into the Souterrain. In the meantime, Shane enlists the help of military historian Mark George in tracking down clues to the identities of the men who left their work in the Souterrain. Some of these carvings are very striking. You know, the, the, the detail and uh, the effort that's gone into them is really quite amazing. Some of them are just people writing their names on the wall because they don't want to be forgotten. And I, I think that's something that really draws me to this project, is the idea that we're really fulfilling their wish by finding out who they were and, and telling their, their stories. One of the carvings, which is, is particularly striking, and it, it actually appears that there are two uh, by the same soldier, a private A.J. Ambler, and these, these caught Shane's eye in the Sioux train, and uh, they, they certainly caught my eye. They stand out uh, from amongst all of these photos as being, you know, really exquisite works of art. These are, are very well done. Uh, and we actually have his, his service number, 
So that's a good, that's a good first step. With this information, Mark can begin his search for Private A.J. Ambler and what became of him. Historian Nick Saunders has dedicated much of his career to the study of trench art, objects and artifacts created by soldiers in time of war. Shane meets him at a skate park in London. We can see the whole landscape has been marked by individuals, um, individuals partaking of a graffiti tradition which goes back thousands of years. Now, in the First World War, very similar landscapes were marked with soldier graffiti in exactly the same way, a marker of presence and life before death. Often the, the term graffiti, and you take a look around and can see all this stuff, and often it's got a negative connotation. Yeah, I think that graffiti does, particularly this kind of graffiti here in South London and in New York and other places around the world, it does have a negative connotation. But I think that they're wrong. I think that it's part and parcel of 20th century, 21st century culture. And it tells you a lot if you can read it and understand it about the people and the times and the places and the experiences that they go through. OK, so how is this going to, uh, how does this extend then to the, to the, the, to the suit train? What is most interesting, I think, and most exciting about the terrain material is that it was clearly in the front line, right near to the front line, made by soldiers who were about to go over the top. So I think you get a very emotional connection in these dark underground places, um, touching perhaps and looking at objects which haven't been touched or looked at for 90 years. And so time disappears uh, and you connect directly with those young soldiers. There's a lot of inscriptions down on the wall, a lot of carvings. I would love to be able to, to, to trace them all and to find out about all of them, mm -hmm. um, but some of them we just can't. But there, there are a couple of good ones, like, for instance, this one. Take a look at this one. Oh, wow. G.M. Phelps. This is absolutely astonishing piece of art. I, I, I see the end of one world, the beginning of another world. It's, it's a very sort of 19th century image and yet it's produced in a definitively 20th century battlefield situation. The oval was the classic Victorian picture frame. With his team in place, Shane makes preparations to go to France. In Canada, historian Mark George may have struck gold. He thinks he's tracked down the personal effects of Private Phelps. The search for the men who created the Sioux Terrain inscriptions has led to St. Thomas, Ontario, hometown of Grant Monroe Phelps. One of five children, he worked for the local railway. In 1915, he enlisted with the 91st Battalion. At the local museum, historian Mark George finds documents relating to Phelps in a long-forgotten file. So there's a picture of uh, Company Quartermaster Sergeant Phelps beside a train, which is likely uh, in St. Thomas. He, he was actually a boiler maker for the Grand Trunk Railway. And, and for his, his enlistment document, he was quite a stocky man, but he, he, he was uh, well-built, I'm sure, from working on boilers. Phelps was active in St. Thomas social circles before the war, a sergeant in the reserves, single and 27 when he enlisted. He took a reduction in rank to private so that he could go overseas with his friends. Two years later, he was dead. At 4.45 a.m. on the morning of the 9th of April, he advanced with the leading wave of our attacking force. At about 6 a.m., after passing through our first objective, he was hit on the back about the kidneys by a piece of shrapnel. His wound was immediately dressed and he was evacuated to a field dressing station at about noon the same day. At this time he was conscious, but he was later reported as having died on the way to hospital. It's hard to imagine how difficult this must have been to read for the family. Uh, I think that this is the sort of an envelope that you would stare at for a long time before you would, you would open it and uh, and I mean, this has been very carefully cared for. It has not been dog-eared, and it was likely carefully folded, and, and uh, probably not something that you would read over and over again once you finally knew what had happened. Incredibly, among the papers is Phelps' personal diary. All right, so yeah.
All right, and it's, it's been fairly sparsely used by him. There are a few entries, not, not many. Uh, on the 31st of March, he has just written cave. Cave, a single word marks Phelps' descent into the underworld. And the last entry in his diary is on Easter Sunday, the 8th of April. And he notes bands playing, lying in the sun on the side of a hill. The next day was the first day of the battle for Vimy Ridge, the day Grant Monroe Phelps and thousands of others would die. There's a horrible sense of foreshadowing when, when you go back through the documents of, of soldiers who have been killed in action. You want to reach back across time and, and somehow warn him, you know. You almost become reluctant to turn the page. In France, trench art expert Nick Saunders enters the Souterrain for the first time. It is very, very, very special. Oh, yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? I've never seen anything like this. In all the caves I've been in uh, and other places where I've seen trench art, I've never seen quite anything like this at all. It's an amazing piece of workmanship, carved out here, sort of lovingly taken back here, and it's, it's absolutely perfect. And the amount of time it must have taken uh, to make that. And then the two privates who were presumably responsible for this, uh, Beckett and Mason, it's got everything you need just to be able to put in that last letter um, from the front. Yeah. And so this would have been crucially vital for maintenance of morale and for maintaining that thin link back to what was your reality and what you hope to do after the war. Sure. piece here. I mean, it's, it's carved into the chalk and it's got uh, the animal here, the number, the Highlanders, Canadian, the name O. Green and his service number. I think many of these um, regimental badges and identifiers uh, really are what is important to put uh, in this place. It's a statement of presence, not just for the man and the soldier and the human being, but a statement of presence for that regiment and battalion. It really identifies the group of men who are sharing this visceral life and death situation. Nick explores the deepest reaches of the Sioux terrain. Oh, God, look at that. Look at that. That is just incredible. In the middle of this terribly savage war, um, hundreds of feet underground, you have such delicate images of, of women. Um, so incredibly well done and, and lovely colored as well. And this one in particular, which is wearing a hat, it sort of counterpoints the savagery of war and yet the, the, the fragile delicacy of memories of men down here carving. What is particularly interesting here is that this is the end of this particular souterrain. So maybe this is why we have these two images of women. This is sort of a memory of a woman uh, in a quiet and emotional place. Uh, and after this, you have to go back out to the world of war. What's unique about the subterranean trench art is that there are so many names. M most trench art is 3D material, and it's usually not named at all, so it's very difficult and rare to find. This is somebody who might not survive uh, another five minutes or five hours, and so it's crucial to put the name there. I was here. This is my name. This is my regiment. My soul is here, even if my body is up somewhere else. A. T. Kynes, and just inside here you can see a date, 30th of March, 1917. So that gives you an exact date, space and time. Absolutely brilliant.
these names are sort of living again. It's almost as if they've been reclaimed from the list of the missing. There's something which just will not be squashed here. There's something of this human spirit that just won't die. And that really comes over as quite a hopeful and inspirational thing. Relaxed and comfortable. Nothing is important except the sound of my voice. And even if you lose the sound of my voice, your subconscious mind will hear me. Barbara Butcher is a hypnotherapist. Your body to relax. Graphologist Elaine Quigley is hoping that she can help her with her claustrophobia. You're going to go on an adventure, and your subconscious mind is going to give you the resources that you need to be able to do this in a way that is enjoyable for you. And I want you to picture Elaine calm, Thousands of miles away from the cavern in northern France, historian Mark George is on the trail of one of its greatest carvers, Alec Ambler. Military records reveal that Ambler was born in Kent, England in 1884. An apprentice stonemason at age 16, he is said to have worked on the future Queen Mother's house and the monuments in Trafalgar Square. He immigrated to Canada in 1905. Seven years later, he married Mary Ann Rosby, bought a farm near Foam Lake, Saskatchewan, and started a family. Ambler enlisted in 1916. He would survive the war and go on to have four children, including Alec Jr., the only child still living today. Come on in. You must be Mark. Mark George. Nice Mark to finally George. meet yeah. you. How are you? Thanks very Talk much. Talk to you on the phone. But... Yeah. How are you? Go pretty good. good. Here's my father in uniform. Ah. Taken in France, January 1917. Isn't that neat? Did he ever talk to you about the war, Alec, when you were growing up? No, very, very little, right? Right. Because the, uh, the soldiers in those days didn't talk about the war. Right. Uh, there were many secrets kept about families. Ah, okay. Right? And that in those days, sure. families didn't talk about one another. Right. Right? Right. But here's another picture I found. Huh? No, I don't know what's on the back of that. What do we got? Me and Dad, 1914. 18 war, A.J. Ambler in military hospital uniform. Oh, and you can see he's got a, a very specialized boot yes. on his left leg. The records th that we found say that he got what's called gas gangrene, yeah. and it troubled him for the rest of his life. He was in pain all the time. Yeah. But he would never let you know he was in pain. Right. You know. But I suppose that would have made him a bit more stern. Oh, yes, he was a stern man. Yeah. 
What was he like as a dad? Did he... Tough. Tough, yeah. Work. Right. You think you're tired? I'll tell you when you're tired. Right. <laughs> but uh, he was a very generous man. What he would do was decorate a cake, take it into the jeweler, and give the jeweler so many tickets and ask him to put it in his glass case. Whoever right. wins the cake, give him the cake. And uh, this one's for the Boy Scouts, so the money go all goes to the Boy Scouts. He never uh, took anything for his work in it. Right. Gee, that's amazing work on the cake. Yes. Yeah. Now, I guess, I guess in a way, it's a bit like carving stone, though. Really, it's a it, different form of sculpture for him. It's a, it's a, it's form, a, it's you know? a different yeah. form of sculpture, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And you were saying, you, you told these, me another time, these are all edible, right? Everything? Uh, everything on there is edible, huh. right? except the tablecloth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, he told you about the carvings he did. Yes, he what, said, I did carvings uh, when I was in the tunnels, in the trenches and tunnels and that. Yeah. And he said, I did those to pass the time away. Uh, but he said, where they are, I don't know because he said I don't know where the tunnels are. So you haven't been back like to Vimy or to France or anything then? I like you never, said you've traveled lots, but I have never been to Vimy, never been to France. If I'd known or could have found out where the tunnel was with these carving, I'd have been gone a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Now that he knows the location of the Sioux terrain, eighty four year old Alec Ambler is determined to go and see his father's carvings for himself. Oh my goodness, that's gorgeous, isn't it? And this is done by, by private A.J. Ambler, who is yes. the, seems to be the, um, the Michelangelo of, of yeah. trench, <laughs> trench See, artists. Certainly does seem to be. In the Sioux terrain, Shane gets Elaine to focus on the carvings, distracting her from her claustrophobia. I can't find, at least not here, any of his handwriting, unless that's his handwriting there. But he's got the battle honors on this side, and then he's done the, uh, the cat badge of the uh, Royal Highlanders of Canada. So detailed. Beautiful. Oh, that's, oh, wow. That's amazing. The, what patience that must have taken and the detail. Now, Parker, you see, uh, the guy that carved this, 8605, low number, so he is kind of one of the earlier guys to be, to join the Canadian Army. Okay. Parker's signature is actually up over here. Oh, I see. Does that little chunk of handwriting there help you at all well, tell us about Parker? it does. Parker? It's quite a flowing piece of writing. Uh, what's interesting about this is that he has got a very clear personality coming through. Usually when people put a, a big K in their writing, it's a sign of a little bit of rebellion. I'm not going to do what other people say. I'll do what I want to do. I get the impression this guy's pretty well a set-up sort of person, knows who he is, knows what he wants. So a little bit of independence of mind? Yep. Do you think he would have gotten into trouble in the military? Possibly. Possibly? <laughs> I don't think he's going to be a, a yes man at all. Can you tell anything from just this little this little sample here and, and the numbers, uh, the way he's done his? his well, the, the thing about it is that the, these are sloping to the right, and the other things are actually um, upright. Up yeah. Now, the sloping to the right, it usually indicates somebody who is a communicator. He is a man who is precise, who is going to do the thing correctly. So, in his soldiering, he will also have been a very loyal and reliable soldier. He would have done what was correct for the regiment and for his own conscience. Oh, this is good. The same person's written both of these. C-O Harvey, and I think the next one down is W.J. Harvey. Um, they're likely to be brothers, even as they come from the same address. Now, the writing is pretty basic, ordinary stuff, and yet it's not weak, it's not um, uninteresting. It's got a good completed loop on the Y in both names, which shows that a person is satisfied and you know aware that things are going well or things are as they should be and these two brothers being together may be comfort for each other. Oh, 
it looks really stressed out, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a, it's a, the, the interesting thing is that he's got um, this loop on his Joe, on the O. He's got a loop inside a loop. And when you've got that, you've got someone who tends to keep himself to himself and... So he's a bit introverted there. Yes, I would think so. But I would guess sometimes um, with a person like this, as a, a release that he could do a bit of complaining... Then he'd be a tough guy to be in a section with? If you were in real trouble, he would be very much there for you, but he could be a bit of a, a misery if he was feeling stressed out, and uh, then maybe he wouldn't be quite so easy to get on with. The first soldier Shane's team has tracked down was Private G.M. Phelps. He was killed the first day of the battle for Vimy Ridge. Uh, OK, there it is, Phelps. That's amazing. How did he get up there? Uh, maybe the guys had, a, had, had bunks or something like that. I don't know. Do you oh. want to get a closer look at that? Yeah, I can see that one. I'd like to see that. Are those two, are they soldiers? Oh, yeah, that. Oh, they I think they're sa they look like sailors. Sailors, don't they? He's not a very educated man. You can tell by the way he's done the letters that He's done a good job, but it's not, it's not a stylish job. He's actually framed it. He's put it into um, a circle, uh, an egg shape, hasn't he? It's like his, um, this is his little one spot where he's safe and he's not in any danger because it's all enclosed like an egg. And I feel that this is something, a man who's very alone and very lonely. He's got the downward movement of the end of his name, the LPS, there's a feeling of depression, of negativity, and I just think that's very, very poignant. Shane has received the news that Private Phelps' diary has been found. Will Elaine be able to shed any more light on this hero of Vimy Ridge? The investigation into the fate of Private Grant Monroe Phelps continues with the arrival of a long-awaited package from Canada. This is... Phelps personal diary. Oh my goodness. <gasps> and it's a little bit fragile because of course it's 90 some odd years old. Oh my goodness. If we can. Delicately. Just... Oh, I know, I'm oh. just terrified. See here, he moves up to support and on the 31st of March, 1917, his entry is cave. Oh, wow. So it, we know precisely the day that he does that. Wow, this, this is so, so powerful just to see this. What's your initial reaction, though, just seeing that little bit of... Uh... Uh, of a man, actually, who's very sensitive, who is not um, uh, going to show it, but he is very sensitive. He's very cautious, too. Um, there's a lot of uh, care before he does anything. Uh, he's, he's, but he's got a, a mind of his own. He does use his initiative back to Arras, there, uh, petrol. Oh, this is so amazing. And he's got his full re patrol report there, ran into a couple of, uh, couple of uh, Fritz bombs, he refers to them as. Yes. He gets shelled on the way back in. Do you know what's interesting here? He seems to have, have got himself psyched up because his, mo his writing, while being very delicate, has got a sort of, a, a certain amount of resolve in it. It's better than waiting. He's got something to do, and that makes it easier. Uh, oh, look, that's like the, the sailors, is it a sailor? The sailor that's drawn that we saw That we saw two sailors. Now, that's interesting. Would he have been copying that just for the sheer practicality of it? That's an interesting thing, thought, isn't it? He might have been, because that's so like the one we saw. It's very like. Yeah. Uh, this is, he's killed that Vivian. This is his. The last entry in his diary on the uh, on Easter Day, and it says, "Bands yeah. playing, laying, laying in, in sun, sun side hill." And the writing actually is flowing much better. So the band and the music must have made him calmer, because this writing is even, and it's flowing, and it's detailed, and you get the feeling that he was fairly peaceful. It sort of seemed a fitting exit, in a way. He had discomfort. 
he obviously had a life that he had to cope with, and yet at that last moment, there was some sort of peace. So if it's any consolation, he had a good last day. Phelps' handwriting has revealed his changing states of mind. The solitary carver in the souterrain becomes the soldier on patrol, purposeful and resolute. And finally, the man at peace with himself on the day before he died. Alec Ambler has arrived in France. He crossed the Atlantic only the day before, and despite suffering a recent stroke, the 84-year-old now prepares to go into the souterrain. When they said down, they meant down too, didn't they? Special precautions are being taken, just in case. And if you do begin to feel you've got trouble breathing, we have got an oxygen kit. I was supposed to bring oxygen with me, but I didn't. No. But it'll be there for me when I get back home. Right. <laughs> Ambler is no stranger to conflict. He served in the RAF during the Second World War. Yeah. Oh, that'll do. Good. Later, he farmed in Manitoba and worked as an RCMP prison guard. Oh, I got the rope. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. 20 feet left here. See, it opens up up here. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, does it? Does being down here give you a greater pre appreciation for what he went through in the war? Oh yes. By far. I mean, you never try. I mean, you know, they say they're in tunnels and that. But you have no idea. I mean, a tunnel. I mean, I, I thought, well, probably it's a straight tunnel, right? And this is entirely different to what I expected to see. Well, wait no longer. 90 years is enough time. Let's go see it. Do you recognize the name? Yes, yes. And there's no worry. Fantastic. Fantastic. You said he was a natural born stonemason? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. And when I see this, I can see where he got the decorating for decorating the cakes, right? <laughs> what amazes me is that he never talked about it. He just said, I can have some badges in the trenches, right? And uh, he wasn't too sure whether he'd put his name on all of them or not. I just feel overwhelmed. <laughs> to the extent, I don't really know what to say. Right? What do you say when you see something like this that has been lost for so many years and then found? And uh, I've been fortunate enough to see it, right? Oh, isn't that? I think, I think that's my favorite one. Yeah, beautiful. That's just fantastic. You know, Oh, it makes me feel very proud of him, right? But then I've always been proud of him, and, and uh, but this makes him feel uh, so much closer to him, close enough that that I could go in the next room, and uh, he would he would be there, right? So yeah. I could uh, just go in there and sit down and talk to him, right? But what I would like to know now. Can I get one of these to take back with me? 
right? That's what I'd like to have. Even if it's only for a short time. Back on the surface, one more surprise awaits Alec Ambler. Oh, it's nice. How'd you Graphologist oh. Elaine Quigley is given a postcard written by Alec Ambler's father during the war. What a get-up he's wearing. My yeah. goodness, that looks a heavy load. Yes. Can I look at the back? Oh, certainly. And what is nice about this, do you know, um, this writing shows a very positive approach to life. The lines slope up a bit. Yes. And there's a, a very wide movement. He's got quite a big space between the letters. And do you know, that actually technically means that he's actually quite self-contained. He doesn't always talk about what he's thinking and feeling. No, no, he doesn't. He, he, he was a man who was very strongly his own person. Did you find him a, 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 a stern father or a very kindly father? He, well, was, he was a very stern father. He was a, a extremely honest man. Right? That's right. right. But I like his writing. The personal pronoun, the I, leans to the left. Now, the left side of the page is the writer, and the right side of the page is other people. Oh, I see. So what he's showing is that he doesn't listen to other people unless he wants to. Yes. Now, do you think you're like that as well? Uh, yes, yes, I probably am, you, yes. You've, you've got a bit of the old yes. man about you. <laughs> he's got nice, generous curves at the end of his writing. Yes. There's virtually no breaks no. anywhere. So this is a single-minded man. This... When it came to working, uh, time didn't matter. It was to have the job done perfectly that mm. mattered to him. Yes, and probably that's why he was a bit of a, a hard taskmaster. He wanted uh, yes. you to yes. accept the same standards that's right. yes. as, as he did. Yes. And, and that was probably um, just wanting the best for uh, you. I can't say enough about today. Because it's been uh, such a tremendous day. I mean... I've seen things today that I never thought I would ever see in my life. And I've heard about the badges, but I mean, I never ever dreamt that I would ever see them. Right? In the year today, I've been able to see them. I've been able to touch them. Right? I've been able to walk where he's walked, and. Uh, it's made me very emotional, and uh, I'm not I'm not normally emotional, right? They they uh, tell me I'm as tough as nails. <laughs> it's just been uh, a day beyond belief, right? Seeing. Ambler's work, and then listening to his uh, his son speak, it gave me you know a real precise picture of the kind of guy we were dealing with. Hard on the outside, soft on the inside, very independent, and I could I, you could see a guy like that uh, in the days leading up before a big battle, you know, keeping him his hand and, and his mind busy. You know, fear is contagious, but so is courage, and. That probably, uh, you know, probably helped the guys in his section and, and his platoon to say, yeah, you know, Ambler's busy and he doesn't seem to be bothered by what's coming up, so maybe I don't, you know, maybe I should find something to do too. I would guess that that single-mindedness probably helped him survive the war. After the war, Ambler returned to his farm in Saskatchewan. But in the 1930s, the Amblers returned to England to take over the family grocery store in North London. He died at the age of 90. I think everybody, and soldiers included, uh, have a desire to leave a legacy. Uh, and there is probably a little bit of a fear when you're a soldier that you'll never get that opportunity, that at any time it could be over. There is an impulse there that you know you want to make sure that you're you're remembered at least by the people that that you loved and cared for. Mm -hmm. 